Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Kim Brown in Baltimore. As 2016 draws to a close, this year certainly was not void of quite interesting and noteworthy political, economic, uh, and cultural developments in Latin America. The continent saw a rightward shift politically in certain countries and also was dealing with a tremendous amount of corruption scandals as well. But what are the trends uh, that occurred in Latin America in 2016 and what can we expect going forward into the new year? Well, to discuss that and to get some analysis and overview, we're joined with our Real News correspondent and producer from Latin America, Greg Wilpert. He's speaking, speaking to us today from Quito, Ecuador. Greg, thanks a lot for joining us. My pleasure. Well, Greg, certainly um, a, a lot to cover. You've been following a number of stories throughout the year. So where shall we get started? Yes, yeah, so, well, I thought maybe we could look at first what have been the overarching trends uh, that you mentioned in the beginning. I mean, one of the things that, of course, for anybody who's been watching uh, Latin America, one of the things that stands out is this kind of um, a rollback of uh, the leftist governments in Latin America. I mean, during this time, what we saw is uh, <clears throat> first in, you know, at the end of the year uh, of last year, that is in December of 2015, uh, the government of Cristina Kirchner, which belonged to the progressive gov blocks of government uh, governments, uh, lost uh, the election and uh, a, a new right-wing government won in Argentina. And then, of course, later on in the year, this was followed by um, a right-wing government in, in Peru, and then another one in, uh, and then the, the overthrow, basically, or the impeachment trial of Dilma Rousseff in Brazil. So there were, there were three governments that really switched hands from, uh, uh, or that, that moved decidedly towards the right. Uh, in, and this was a continuation of a trend that had already been taking place uh, in, earlier already uh, in, uh, with, uh, with the overthrow of uh, the government in Honduras in 2009, 2010, and then also in Paraguay. So there's been an ongoing trend that the leftist governments have been defeated uh, the, in the region. That's one major trend that was continued in 2016. The other major trend is kind of the intensification of and discovery of corruption scandals uh, throughout Latin America. This was particularly true in Brazil, in Chile, and to a less, lesser extent uh, with minor uh, things going on in Ecuador and Bolivia um, and, uh, and also in Venezuela. So, um, and then the, then the kind of the third trend that I would highlight that has affected the region as a whole, I would say, is that many of the governments in the region have become highly unpopular. I mean, and this is especially true in the cases of uh, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, and to a lesser extent perhaps in Venezuela, which is going through tremendous pro uh, problems, and we'll get into the details of that. Um, the only governments where you can say that they're truly still uh, ha have high popularity ratings, I would say, are Nicaragua, Ecuador, and Bolivia. Um, so, so those are some of the trends. There's, and we, can probably, we should probably unpack a little bit, uh, and we can do that when we get into the individual countries, as to why um, there have been this uh, right way, rightward spring uh, and why the governments are unpopular. But um, just as a general trend, I would uh, mention that um, there's a been, been a significant decline in uh, raw material prices, that is commodity prices, as it's called among economists, uh, and also many of these governments have made uh, mistakes or have uh, implemented policies that were highly unpopular. So, so this kind of explains the background. I would say it's a combination of, of, uh, you know, of, of, a, uh, um, of an economic trend in, 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 that is a recession in the region and also of, uh, of uh, trying to implement or deepen neoliberal policies that uh, really uh, just intensify the economic crisis and the inequality of the region. Okay, Greg, well, let's uh, go through some of these countries uh, individually. Let's start with Mexico. Um, Mexico obviously dealing with a number of issues, uh, including strikes, from teachers and doctors. As you mentioned, the administration of President Enrique Peña Nieto, not super popular. He had a visit from then GOP Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. Um, a, a lot going on in Mexico. What, what are the main takeaways? Yeah, I mean, that certainly Mexico belongs to one of the ones that uh, remains right. It never had this kind of leftward swing or this pink tide, as some people have called it. Uh, that affected most of Latin America in the early 2000s uh, until you know 2015 or so. It didn't wasn't part of that trend, and 
Um, so that's one of the interesting things. So it's basically been a, a governments that were governed consistently by right-wing governments um, that uh, that implemented neoliberal, neoliberalism, privatized pretty much everything that they could privatize. Now they're touching, so to speak, the crown jewels, which is the oil industry. They're trying to privatize that. Uh, and at the same time, and this is also well known, that when you're trying to implement uh, neoliberal policies of privatization, of austerity, of um, reducing the public sector, uh, this is often accompanied with um, protest movements, with social movements that are uh, objecting to these policies. And uh, so there's been a concomitant uh, wave of repression in Mexico. Uh, one of the things, of course, that I, this, uh, that I should also mention in Mexico is that it's, this has been combined in a very toxic combination with uh, the fight against uh, the uh, drug trafficking in Mexico. Uh, so, so there's been some overlap that is uh, the effort to, uh, you know, with you know, tens of thousands of people killed in the war on drugs in, in Mexico, but at the same time, uh, these same mechanisms and the same uh, tools that were used to, for the drug war are being also applied to some extent against the social movements in Mexico. So there's been a tremendous amount of repression. And this has actually, in the end effect, ironically, uh, strengthened the progressive movements of the left in, Latin America, in Mexico, and it actually results in uh, relatively good prospects for them uh, for 2017, uh, or actually the presidential election will happen in 2018 uh, with uh, Manuel Lopez, uh, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who was the main left progressive uh, candidate for the presidency uh, back in 2012, where he lost. He's actually leading in the polls. He founded a new party, and uh, it's uh, been gaining tremendously uh, by leaps and bounds in popularity in Mexico. And so it, he seems to have, uh, he might have a good chance of actually winning the presidency next time around uh, in, in 2018. Well, Greg, uh, one quick question. So how is Mexico faring economically? Because as the United States is enjoying a, a robust stock market, for whatever that's worth, with the stock market um, setting trends, the, you know, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, um, over 20,000 points really for the first time in history. But at the same time, uh, during the presidential uh, campaign um, with the rise of Donald Trump, now the president-elect. We saw the Mexican peso really take a hit. Were those things connected in any way? Yes. I mean, the situation and the economic situation in Mexico has certainly um, been very difficult, especially with, like I said, the shrinking of the public sector, uh, efforts to cut down on wages for the public sector. That's why there have been so many teachers and doctor strikes going on in Mexico. Uh, and the increasing austerity has meant uh, basically a more difficult situation and the increasing in inequality. So even though the economy has been relatively stable, uh, inequality has certainly gone up significantly in Mexico. And uh, that's what's promoted a lot of the, um, the uprisings and social movements in Mexico. Indeed. So let's move along to Colombia, which had a referendum vote put to the people um, about uh, how best to negotiate the uh, peace, lasting peace between the Colombian government and the FARC rebels. Take us there. So Colombia, yes, is another government that uh, has uh, maintained this rightward uh, uh, position for a right-wing government for a very long time now. And one of the reasons, of course, was that in Colombia uh, has had, uh, you know, the civil war going on for decades, for 50 years now. And that's finally being put to arrest. Uh, and this is really a significant achievement because the civil war in Colombia has always been kind of the excuse uh, to crack down on progressive and social movements in, in Mexico, uh, sorry, Colombia, and to uh, use that as uh, you know, to, to basically to, to claim that any activists are uh, parts of the guerrilla forces and therefore they, you know, would be persecuted. And so that's now actually being coming to an end. So that's a very important move, which means it's an opening for the left. Uh, and might mean that uh, progressive forces in, in Colombia will actually have a chance to to finally uh, take over government, maybe, maybe not, uh, you know, the elections there won't be probably until late um, or mid-2018, so it's still a ways off. But, um, and, you know, might not be, it might be too early for, for, uh, for them to, to really make inroads in the political system, but, but they certainly have better chances now than they ever did before. However, one should also keep in mind that in Colombia there's a continuing influence of the right, the far right, 
uh, especially the former president Alvaro Uribe and the paramilitary forces are still a force to be reckoned with and are continuing the repression uh, and uh, assassination campaigns against activists uh, in Colombia. So it's, it still remains a hot spot, but like I said, I do think uh, it's, uh, it also has, has better chances, just like Mexico, uh, for, uh, for other forces to come up and, and to turn things around uh, in that country. And another country that took a bit of a rightward shift this year was that of Peru, uh, who in July of this year uh, elected Pedro Pablo Kuczynski. Tell us about uh, now President Kuczynski, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Right. Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's also another neoliberal. He took over uh, after somebody who was nominally progressive, but it turned out to be mostly uh, middle of the road, that is uh, Ollanta Humala. He was originally thought to be maybe somebody who would uh, follow in, in Hugo Chavez's uh, footsteps of Venezuela, uh, but turned out to be very centrist and, and didn't do much of anything. Uh, now there's a new neoliberal government, I mean, that's really uh, moving the country economically to the right uh, in Peru, and so um, <clears throat> so this, in that sense, continues this trend of a rightward shift in Latin America. And uh, he's already started to, to, I mean, he's only taken office since July, so it's a little bit too early to see exactly what he's doing or what he plans to do. But he's basically announced, uh, you know, also uh, privatizations and, and uh, cutbacks in, in, in the public sector. And so, so uh, we have to see now how progressive forces in uh, Peru are going to react to that, if at all. And, uh, but uh, one positive light there for, for more progressive forces in Peru was the fact that uh, they did manage to almost make the runoff vote uh, in uh, the presidential election uh, in the middle of the year. Uh, so they might be able to build on that. Uh, and we'll have to see this in Peru. It's still a little bit early to see what direction things are going to take. And lastly, at least for this uh, first segment here, Greg, let's talk about Honduras, where uh, continuing human rights abuses continue, especially uh, in the wake of some notable activists being murdered in 2016. Yes, so, so this year we saw the assassination of Berta Cáceres, uh, who was an uh, environmental and human rights activist, uh, which really hit a blow. It wasn't just because she was an activist, but because she was a leader of one of the main uh, organizations fighting the construction of a, da a dam in, uh, in Honduras. And uh, she was brutally killed. Uh, along with other, uh, there were something like over 100 other activists have been assassinated actually in Honduras since 2014. Uh, so this whole wave of repression of uh, social, social movements in Honduras has continued unabated in Honduras. So this is, again, another instance of uh, how, uh, uh, how popular resistance is being met with brutal force uh, in, in Latin America. So, Greg, uh, the country of Brazil was certainly in the headlines for a number of reasons this year. Obviously, the Summer Olympics in Rio gained a lot of uh, international attention, but um, especially how people, the poor people in the favelas were displaced and removed in order to accommodate the Olympics. And then President, at least then President Dilma Rousseff, was not even in attendance because of uh, the political um, opposition that she was dealing with at the time. What kind of year did Brazil have? Yes, we had to cover Brazil a lot, um, not, not only because it's uh, one of the largest or the largest country in Latin America, but also because it's uh, it, a lot happened, like you mentioned. Uh, and perhaps the most significant event really was uh, the removal of Dilma Rousseff from office on charges of that she uh, committed some administrative irregularities in the budgeting process, uh, which proved to be, and they even admitted it, the opposition admitted it in the end, uh, that it was really an excuse to get rid of her, really. Uh, that the real reason they wanted to get rid of her is because she was an represented an obstacle to the uh, imposition of, uh, of uh, a neoliberal neo economic policies in, in Brazil. And, um, and so this had really nothing to do uh, with the formal reasons that were presented for impeaching her. And that's why, with reason, uh, people, uh, pr particularly supporters of Dilma Rousseff, uh, called it a legislative coup. Um, they, uh, <coughs> 
so, the, so this was really a, a major, major event in, in shifting uh, the politics of the whole region to the right. And uh, of course, they managed to t uh, do this because uh, they took advantage of uh, a whole series of corruption scandals and investigations into corruptions that had been taking place uh, since actually late uh, last year. And, um, and they have been engulfing more and more of uh, uh, Brazil's political class. And so that was usually used as an, also as an excuse or as an opportunity, really, because her own popularity had sunk into the basement. And so they saw this as an opportunity to strike against her and to get rid of her. Um, I mean, the campaign to get rid of her already started right after her election in 2014. And so it was really culminated with this impeachment in August of, of this year. Um, at the same time, now more and more people are mobilizing against um, uh, the, uh, the new government of Michel Temer, which has, like I said, taken a very hard right uh, swing in the sense of uh, uh, introducing a whole bunch of uh, uh, privatizations. They want to privatize you know, the, uh, the, the, the airports. Uh, they want to privatize all kinds of different sectors, uh, telecommunications, just all kinds of things. and. Um, <clears throat> and at the same time, they're also, uh, of course, cutting back. And one of the, perhaps the most significant thing uh, in terms of cutting back in, ter uh, in the public spe sector is, is their uh, introduction of a constitutional reform that will freeze public spending for the next 20 years. Of course, against that, many people are mobilizing. Students have been mobilizing. One of the things people most, most people don't know is that one over 1,000 um, schools, primary schools, have been closed down because of occupations by the students. Uh, university protests have been taking place. And uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the landless uh, workers movement, the MST, has been mobilizing very strongly against the government of Michel Temer. And they've been suffering also lots of repression in the form of uh, having their offices raided recently. And now many of their leaders are facing accusations of being some form of a criminal organization. So, uh, so we see the, the, the conflict in, uh, in Brazil really intensifying. Indeed, Greg. Well, listen, we have a whole other segment to come back and discuss the year in 2016 politically and culturally in Latin America. We've been speaking with our Latin American correspondent and producer, Greg Wilpert. So stick around, and thanks for watching The Real News.